So, sis, could you please introduce yourself to everybody? What's your name? Who's your mob? Where are you? And what do you do? Yes, so my name is Malil Mamey and I'm a Larrakia woman living on Gula Merchant, which is Darwin. And I am a law student and a writer and also the CEO of Uprising of the People. So, Sis, what are you normally doing this time of year in the lead up to and on January 26th on Larrakia lands? On Larrakia lands, usually for Invasion Day, I'm preparing to protest and march on the streets and be with my community and my mob. And in the past, we've gathered at Civic Park, which is in the city on Larrakia lands. And an organisation called Community Solidarity in Action has previously held Survival Day events, which has music and art and food all at Civic Park, and it's really beautiful. And then last year, Uprising of the People organised a protest, and it was the first time that we had an Invasion Day protest, which was quite a step up um, from what had usually been happening in Darwin. And... In previous years before that, I had been in other places, so going to Yarburn and the Invasion Day stuff down there or Spirit Festival down in Melbourne. So it was those sort of events had inspired us to do our own type of thing up here in Darwin. Um, so, yeah, usually protesting and marching down the street. That's obviously changed pretty dramatically this year. Um, you know, Northern Territory is now experiencing thousands of cases including in our remote communities. It's uh, a scary time for a lot of us. We all have families out there. I'm down in New South Wales, but I'm thinking of all my family back home, especially in Lejimano and Yundamu. And I'm sure you're thinking about all your families. How has this situation changed your plans this year? Um, this situation with the pandemic and the way that the government's been struggling to manage it has really meant that we as the community had to reprioritize what we were going to do on invasion day and where we were going to put our energy um, it's been a really scary time in the nt particularly with all the cases that have um, basically exploded in a lot of the remote communities um, like you mentioned large manu you and demu those deserts communities are in lockouts and lockdowns and we have a lot of communities in the top end um, like the Tiwi Islands are in lockdown as well and Galawinku and it's really scary because those case numbers are going up and today uh, Natasha Files actually said that they are getting the um, defence force to help with aeroplanes to help fly mob out of those communities and get them into Howard Springs with the Centre of National Resilience. So it's been a scary time and we really had to think about the safety of our community and the idea of getting everyone to exert their energy for this one day on Invasion Day and potentially all come together and all march down the street and have this pressure of um, activism and protest on this day didn't sit right with me it felt um like it was we could spend our energy in better places and that we actually needed to rest more than anything else and we needed to be able to be ready to share our resources um for our mob and families in remote communities i'll um touch on that idea of rest in a moment sis but one thing you raised there, I mean, it's uh, interesting timing. It makes sense, I guess, it's happening across the country, but worries of the Aboriginal resistance have recently made a similar decision down in Melbourne on Coolin lands to postpone any Invasion Day rallies and events for this year for similar reasons of the, the threat of coronavirus and how vulnerable our communities are. What does it mean to be an organiser and the sorts of responsibilities that come with that around bringing communities together? Organisers have huge responsibilities and I was really relieved when I saw that war had also um, postponed their or cancelled their protest event. I know they're still doing their dawn service, I believe, which is very special um, and we can watch that online. 
Um, as an organiser and when you're really thinking about your community and our kinship system and the way that we maintain and sustain our communities, we have to think about the safety of our people. And that has to be first and foremost our priority. And seeing the way that war and also uprising have chosen to step back from protesting, which brings people together, which is high risk for COVID, especially when our people are so vulnerable to COVID because we already have pre-existing health conditions. And in the Northern Territory, we do not have enough health resources at the best of times anyway, um, or enough hospitals or enough beds, et cetera, to manage um, the outbreaks of coronavirus. So to actually, as an organiser, it felt like my responsibility to lead by example and rather than having this constant fire of we have to do something, we have to do something, actually the action that we needed to take had to go in a different direction. And as an organiser, it was my responsibility to think about how I'm going to help guide people or lead people in a way that's actually going to be healthier and better for our community. So uprising is calling for our communities to rest as a form of resistance. It's something I've already seen resonate with a lot of your followers on your Instagram pages and certainly for myself and a lot of the mobs I'm speaking to, you know, being told that it is okay to rest at the moment. I think it's something that a lot of us have been needing to hear what is it about rest, which is in itself a form of resistance? Well, historically, we haven't been able to have a good sleep. You know, our people are either having to be enslaved and working for either flour or rations and not even have money, or we're tossing and turning at night worrying about our families who are sick or worrying about those who have passed on or we're worried about those who've gone missing, or we're worried about those who are in detention. Our people just don't get to rest. We are not allowed to rest. The society that we live in is built to make us exhausted and fatigued, which um, traces back to how slavery was so successful in that messed up way, because our people had been so fatigued by working so hard and being so emotionally drained at what circumstances we were going through that it was really hard to fight because we hadn't rested. And how can you even stand up when you haven't had a good sleep? So the idea of resting is really hard for our mob to also let us have. It's really hard for us to let ourselves rest because we're constantly told that black fellows are lazy, that we are on the dole, that we don't do any work and that all we do is sit around campfires or drink alcohol, etc. So we have all these pressures to say we're not doing enough, we're not doing enough, when in fact every day is a fight and every day is exhausting for us. And so this idea of letting ourselves rest is huge. It's revolutionary because that's actually saying, hold on a second, I need to look after my body and my sisters and my brothers before we can do anything else. And I think the hardest part is letting ourselves know and believe that we are allowed to rest because that's fighting a lot of stereotypes. That's a really good point, Sis. And in your Indigenous X piece, you, you mentioned that this is not new thinking. This is something that black people across the world marginalized groups have been talking and theorizing about for decades in your research you found this concept which um, blew me away the idea of a black power nap how would you define a black power nap first of all i love the sound of a black power nap because if you're a black fellow like me who feels guilty about napping <laughs> the idea that we could be part of like the black panthers by napping is change it's changed my life and so when I think about a black power nap I think of recharging and like revitalizing ourselves and really knowing that there's power in our bodies getting rest and that we can then have energy to continue our fight or continue 
any type of way that we stand up against the colony, we can do that once we're rested and once we have naps. And the amazing thing about black power naps is they um, did research and found that black people in the States have one hour less sleep a night than their white counterparts. And that black people take longer to fall asleep than their white counterparts. So I did some research and found they did pediatric studies um, in 2012, um, different hospitals across Australia studied Indigenous children between the ages of six and 13 and the sleep related problems that they were having at higher rates than non-Indigenous peers. And the data found that compared with non-Indigenous children, that Indigenous children were having poorer sleep quality and decreased sleep duration and increased sleepiness. And then all of this led to struggles with school, with moods and aggression, um, being withdrawn from the classroom and from other people and struggling to have the brain capacity to read and um, do mathematics. So it, as there's strong correlations between having bad sleep and then how that affects children in school and even interpersonal relationships. And it got me thinking about all the different factors that contribute to us not having good sleep. And so there's the emotional elements of the traumas that we experience as blackfellas from intergenerational traumas to current addictions and grief, et cetera, and racism. But then there's also the sort of structural problems like overcrowded housing, not having access to power. Here in the Northern Territory, a lot of remote communities, um, particularly across um, more recently across the top end, we only get um, coverage from Telstra and the different towers at different times are quite faulty. And so communities like Manningrida have lost power numerous times in the past few months. And this has meant that people don't have access to money through ATMs, don't have access to just power for fans and air conditioning. So how can you have a good sleep when those are the circumstances that you're living in? It's a really good point, sis, because it makes me think about when we want to advocate for rest as a form of resistance, but also, like you said, as a way to preserve ourselves and conserve our energy for the fights that we do need to take on in the future. How do we make that concept accessible? Because we know, you know, as well as the living situations that so many of our mobs are in, our people are carers, they have responsibilities. It's hard to switch off and say, okay, I need to take time for myself right now because that is the thing that's going to allow me to have more energy in the long run. How, how can we make rest more accessible to everybody? Um, you're right in identifying that being able to rest and nap whenever you want is a classes issue. So the more money and access to resources you have, the more storage you have. And um, that ministry in the US highlights that they think that sleep deprivation should be a key justice issue that we fight for. And so your question about accessing rest really comes down to, I think we've seen in the pandemic, right? In the early start of the pandemic, the government offered financial support to people who weren't able to go to work because of COVID. Now that's an example to show that the government and institutions and workplaces actually have the potential to prioritize where they put money and spending to allow for people to rest. So in the early stage of the pandemic in 2020, we saw that we were being more financially supported by the government to allow us to be isolating and staying at home and resting to prevent outbreaks of COVID. Um, however, we're seeing huge changes with that now, and there are heaps of memes about it on social media um, that show that, they, that napping is really inaccessible for people who don't have the funds and who are carers. And I don't think I have all the answers for that right now. And I think that I actually come from quite a place of privilege in being able 
to rest. And my ideas around how we can encourage people to rest are more about how allies and people with more resources can share those resources to alleviate the pressures off of black fellas who are not able to rest. So simple ways that that can be done is, especially context now with the pandemic, is that if you're able to buy rat tests or buy masks and you know that your neighbours cannot afford them or do not have the time to leave their home to go and get them, then the way that you can help your neighbours to rest is to provide them with masks and rat tests. And that concept can be applied to food, can be applied to grocery shopping, can be applied to essentials and hygiene products, um, for like pads and tampons or period undies, etc., those things can actually be gifted. And that's actually something that everyone can do. We all have something that we can gift to someone else that actually creates time in their day where they don't have to worry about that. So I think the idea of sharing with your neighbour is probably the starting point to making rest accessible for your neighbor. It's not really about thinking about yourself initially. It's actually about thinking about the person next door and how you can create rest for them. I think that's a really nice idea. How can you create rest for other people? And also speaking to sleep deprivation as a key justice issue, that's that's revolutionary, like you said. Uh, Sis, I wanna finish on the beautiful connection you drew in your article between Dungalaba, your totem, saltwater crocodile, and their ability to rest and conserve energy. What strength do you draw from your totem and your culture? Um, it All of my strength really comes from knowing that that's who I am, that I'm a Dungalaba. And when I had that realisation that I was a Dungalaba and that Dungalaba are so clever with how they hunt and how they've survived for millennia I realized that I was actually just draining myself trying to be anything other than who I was which it was the Dungalaba and so I draw all of my strength from thinking about how the Dungalaba really prioritize their energy and how they bathe in the sun all the time on the riverbanks and just cruise through the river systems and through the ocean and I admire that so much. And they've managed to survive since the dinosaurs were here and have continued to exist even through periods of almost extinction at the hands of humans killing them with guns. And so if the Dungalaba can find time to rest on the shores and sunbathe in the mud, then I feel like I need to make time for myself to do that as well. <laughs> Thank you, Sis. Um, I really enjoyed learning so much from your piece and your words. It's something that I'm really taking to heart this time of year. So thank you. No, thank you.